All right. Welcome to the fourth episode of the Life Possible Podcast. The Life Possible Podcast uh, spotlights successful coaches, clients, and clinic owners who have successfully used the ideal protein protocol to reset their body, reset their mind, and reset possible. These individuals truly have had life-changing experiences, and now as a result, they're pursuing goals and dreams in life that they thought were dead and gone. They're pursuing goals and dreams in life they never even knew they wanted to pursue. They are pursuing a life that's so precious to them that they can't imagine going back to the way they were before. A life that they love so much that they don't even feel a need to escape from it. It is my hope that you will see and hear and connect with these individuals uh, and their stories and understand that they are just like you. And if they can do it, you can do it too. It's my hope that through this podcast, we can reach and inspire as many people as possible to take full advantage of the Ideal Protein Protocol, uh, more, more so than weight loss, but actually for life change. Who am I? Uh, my name is Dr. John Barnes. I'm the clinic director at Barnes Chiropractic Health and Fitness in Centerville, Virginia, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C., um, we have been an independent authorized ideal protein clinic now for over five years. Uh, five years ago, the ideal protein program came to me as the answer to many of my prayers, both personally and professionally. Um, you see back then, well, there's no other way to put it. I was fat, sick, and depressed, and I didn't see a way out. In fact, I had pretty much given up. Uh, initially, uh, when I started ideal protein, I lost 45 pounds when I did phase one, but more importantly than that, it changed my life. So many symptoms and health issues that I didn't even understand were nutrition related uh, disappeared while I was going through that phase one. I discovered th that the true power of this protocol is more what it does for you on the inside than anything that it does for you on the outside. Um, so for the past five years, it's been my passion to research and understand this power. And so now I'm over 60 pounds down from my original weight, and I've been training and participating in the sport of triathlon after over 25 years of inactivity. Again, something I, I never even considered would be a possibility for me. Um, and it's become my life possible. So let's get to today's guest. We've got a lot of ground to cover, um, and I, I couldn't be more excited about our next guest. Um, my next guest is Cindy Savage. Uh, Cindy Savage, um, she's 56 years old, and she's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, she started her Ideal Protein journey with us three years ago here at Barnes Chiropractic Health and Fitness. Uh, since that time, she's lost over 70 pounds, but more amazingly, she's become the runner that she has always wanted to be. Uh, she's done phase one twice in an effort to get to where she is today, and we're going to talk about that because it's a fascinating story, and I'm confident that this lady will never have to revisit phase one again. Um, among her accomplishments, her running accomplishments over the past two years includes one full marathon. Um, but seven half marathons, that's quite a schedule that she, uh, she has had over the past two years. More importantly than this, I truly feel like she's become the master of her metabolic health. She has become an incredible resource and advocate for nutrition and lifestyle change. And she truly exemplifies somebody who's living life possible. She's doing her best to educate and encourage others to do the same, but she's truly doing it by living through example first. Uh, so please, with no further ado, welcome Cindy Savage. Hey, Cindy, how are you? I'm doing well, Dr. Barnes. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited about this. In fact, uh, I, I want to let everybody know we were kind of running through our outline uh, earlier and we we found ourselves just having to, so much fun, we didn't even know what time it was. So we decided if this is a little rough, it's because uh, we've just got to get through this material. Um, so real quickly, um, we met, I believe we met, uh, when I was giving a talk a couple of years ago uh, for my dear friend and our Ideal Protein buddy, Lynn Roos. Um, I was giving a talk for her church, a church group that she had put together. Um, 
tell us about that. How, how do you know Lynn and how did you come to be at this talk? Well, Lynn has become a very dear friend of mine as well. We met several years ago. We were both working for the county and we were in the same county offices here in Virginia. And we just, uh, were, we connected very well. We became friends. We would go to lunch together. Uh, we would talk about the good things in our lives and we would talk about the challenging things in our lives, which a lot of the time at that point was weight. Um, and uh, we just, you know, supported each other a lot. Um, and then I got an opportunity to take another job. So I left the county. Um, but Len and I stayed connected, you know, virtually as many people do through Facebook. And I was watching Len post on Facebook about her incredible weight loss journey and just like always being amazed. And uh, because, you know, we had always been talking about how difficult that was for us at the time uh, when I knew her at the county. So I said, Lynn, you look amazing. How did you do that? And she started telling me about Ideal Protein. And I don't remember if it was when I reached out to her that day or if it was uh, just a couple of days later, a little while later, she reached out to me and said, hey, you know, Cindy, if you're interested, um, my coach, who was Dr. John Barnes, Glenn's coach, is a wonderful coach, and he's going to come and talk to her small group that she was a part of at her church and asked if I would want to, to be a part of that. And I was like, can I do that even though I'm not a part of your church? She yeah. said, of course, we'd love to have you come. Please come. So I did, and I listened to your your talk. I was moved to tears, and you know, waited uh, afterwards to talk with you. And we had a chat, and we set a time for me to be able to come and do an individual consultation. Yeah, I think like I the next week or two. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And and the ironic thing to me was, Lynn was so excited to put that group together. And uh, it ended up, uh, unfortunately, not becoming what the vision that she had for it. And uh, so when I gave that talk, there was over 30 people in the room there. And she and I just, gosh, had these dreams and visions for these people. And uh, you were the one that got the message. <laughs> and, yeah, I, you know, do, I think that was an intervention by God. I really do. It was, uh, it, it was meant to be. So that he brought us together for, for that and for everything that's happened since. And I just can't be thankful enough. Yeah, me neither. It's, it's just been such an amazing adventure for us. Um, so you started uh, Ideal Protein with us soon after that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, that first time around, you lost 50 pounds. Yeah. Uh, and that was October through March. And, and we're going to see a recurring theme here. That means that you did it through the holiday season. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, well, I think we're going to talk a little bit about my, my journey with weight loss and I always do pretty well with structure. And I knew that, mm -hmm. um, if I had something structured to get me through the holidays, uh, I would, would, you know, have a much better result. So yeah, <laughs> I do like to have that structure through the holidays. <laughs> and you know, that is an excellent point for anybody, uh, to, to take home out there. Um, I ha had approached it as thinking who in the right mind would, would try to do ideal protein through the holidays, but that's exactly why, right? Mm -hmm. The holidays are the hardest time for people who are struggling with, with eating and weight issues. And so if you do have structure to guide you through those months, not only are you not going to gain the weight you normally do, you're going to continue to lose weight, especially if you get hooked on what's happening. So that was brilliant. I, I applaud you. And I, <laughs> so amazing. But the other thing that happened was, um, I, I remember then when we got to March, that you decided that you wanted to, um, you wanted to pull up short of your weight loss goal. We, you had set a weight loss goal with me and uh, you were working with Lori as well at the time. Yeah. And uh, as you guys were tearing through this protocol, you decided, uh, and I remember she was, she was a little sad when she came to me and she said, you know, Cindy wants to quit early because she wants to run and, and, you know, she's not allowed to run in phase one. So um, tell me about that. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I'll just have to start with all my life as, that I can remember from childhood. I've always kind of struggled with my weight, um, been a little chunky. And uh, at 16 was when I did my first official weight loss program, went through uh, 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 hypnosis and a, and a pro uh, like a, it was a high protein program, actually lost a lot of weight. 
but I just always up and down went back went to college got that you know freshman 15 20 uh, pounds and then I would have to do stuff like run <laughs> and aerobics because that was back in the 80s when Jane Fonda aerobics was very popular so I got into that um, always eating the standard American diet you know uh, tried to do the good foods like the boneless chicken breasts and popcorn and all that kind of stuff just basically was following the standard American diet unless I was doing a structured program and doing um, all those exercises and you know that worked for me pretty well to kind of maintain and I did a lot of up and down up and down up and down um, until I had children I had children in my early 30s um, tried to keep up with that running routine um, but I was having a lot more challenge with with maintaining the kind of look I wanted to have with my weight and with my body composition I'm a I'm a bigger I'm a larger woman tall big boned um, and honestly, uh, Dr. Barnes uh, destroyed my thyroid. I had to be put on thyroid medication. Um, and but I was still trying to run. I just kept running and kept running. And I was always hurting myself. I knew my my podiatrist was my friend. Uh, <laughs> I had lots of times to visit with him and work my feet because my ankles and feet were always hurting. Plantar fasciitis, just so many issues. But I kept running and kept running. Um, and when we moved to Virginia, I started trying to train for a half marathon back in 2013. Um, and really, I hurt my foot. And after I ran that marathon, because I'm determined once I set a goal to reach it. So I ran the marathon on a hurt foot and I could not I, I hurt it so badly that um, the podiatrist I had up here put me in a boot and said, I can't do anything for two months on my feet. Um, and then after that, I started putting the weight the, I couldn't fight the weight anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't run. And when I got out of the boot, it hurt, still hurt to run. And I kept putting on more weight and my foot kept hurting. So I just didn't get to run for like two years. I'd given up. Basically, I had just come to a point in my life where I was 50. Um, my foot hurt. I couldn't fight my weight anymore. I wasn't doing the up and down. I was con just doing the up all the time. And I thought to myself, this is just the way it is. I'm 50. I'm old. Um, and I'm just going to have to accept myself the way I am. So when I got to ideal protein and lost the weight, I was like, I feel great. Of course, you know, like the pain was going away. I didn't have all those aches and pains. I didn't have all that weight holding me down and I was like I want to start running again I cannot wait till I reach the goal weight that we had determined when I first started I, I want to go now and so you and Lori work with me to do that yeah so we went ahead and we got you phased off um, so that you could get back to running again and uh, so that was March of 2018 um, so it, you were so excited and how did those first couple of months go? Your reintroduction to running? Uh, tell us about how that went. You know, it went it went really well at first. I I was staying on that maintenance part of Ideal Protein. I was, you know, doing my running. I I had a friend who was part of a big running group here, and so I joined that running group. It was you know, and we we got together and did runs. Um, I. Uh, ran a 10k, the uh, prison break 10k in April, I believe, March, and um, felt really good. And so I signed up for another half marathon. This, you know, <laughs> was uh, going to be the the time when hopefully I, I could actually get through a half marathon without hurting. So I ran the historic half marathon with, so, with my friends. But also, you had told me so you you did that 10k. Yeah. Uh, which for those people that uh, don't do metrics, that's a six mile run. Um, yes. I got to I got to jab my Canadian friends too. Um, <laughs> but uh, and then you signed up for a half marathon, and a half marathon is thirteen point one miles, right? Yes. Yeah. But some something happened somewhere in there that uh, gave you an opportunity that you might actually be able to run a, a very popular marathon later in that year and this is this is something that usually just doesn't happen to somebody tell us about that story 
Yeah, um, you know, so when you're sharing on Facebook with your friends and everything, at some point I had shared that that would be really cool if maybe one day I could do a, a marathon that was a long-term goal that maybe or maybe I wouldn't realize. I wasn't sure. I was really scared of it. And um, a bunch of the ladies in my group run a race called the 1775 with the Marines, like their series, their race series. And when you run the 1775, you get an automatic entry into the Marine Corps Marathon. There's very limited ways to be able to uh, run the Marine Corps Marathon that's in October to be able to get into it. Yeah, it's a hugely popular race. How many people it's, run in that race? Oh, thousands. It's, a pe yeah, it's the People's it's Marathon. <laughs> yep. It's very popular. But it's very hard to get into. Yes. Um, and at that time, they were allowing if someone ran the 1775 and, and you know, uh, got an entrance into the into the marathon, if they didn't want to run it, they, they, they could give it to somebody else. So a friend of mine ran it and she called me out on Facebook. She was like, hey, I'm not going to run this. Um, so I have an opportunity and opening Cindy Savage. <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK, I guess I. I guess I should do this. I did say it was a dream of mine. So, yep. you know, I took so up that opportunity. Goes. So, yeah. And so then, um, you know, initially when you had, we had gotten you into phase two and three and four, you know, we talked about being cautious with carbohydrates and, and not allowing them to get out of control. Um, and so in the beginning of this running training, um, you know, tell us about your nutritional thoughts in the beginning and then uh, what ended up happening as the months, weeks went by. Yeah. So, you know, I was trying really hard to stay at least whole food focused because the prevailing thought or guidance is that uh, in order to run a long distance, you have to use carbs like you can't run without having carbs. And a lot of that is typically in the form of sugar. Um, so I was like, okay, but I don't want to do like regular sugar. I'll do whole food sugar. So I had, uh, you know, I made dates stuffed with almond butter and chia seeds and those kinds of things that are high in sugar fruits, um, but, you know, not really uh, something that would be prepackaged or something like that. But as I continued to have, I had a pretty um, hardcore training program because I was so terrified I wouldn't be able to finish 26 miles. I was going to make sure I was well trained. Um, yep. And as I started increasing the mileage, I started saying things like, oh, my my legs are locking up. I'm having some cramps in my legs. And, and of course, all the guidance that you get um, is that you need to have carbs, you need sugar, you probably need to start using different kinds of sugars and things like that. Um, so I started to become more open to packaged sugared foods that many racers use. And you get those kinds of things too, um, because I was running the whole Marine Corps series, I wanted to get uh, this big uh, medal at the end if you run several different kinds of Marine Corps races. So that year, I ran all of those races. And at the beginning, when you go to the shows to get your bibs and all of that, they start giving you things for you to use yep. during your race. There's um, always like sports freebies. Beans and, uh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. What? Wait, wait, wait. Sports beans because, what? you know, they're there to help you run. Can you, so, <laughs> they're, they're athletic so, health food. <laughs> what's really funny is, and, and I don't think that it was you that brought it in. I think it was another one of my clients that was getting into uh, actually ice hockey. And he was, he was so excited about the things that he was using to help fuel his hockey. Uh, he brought it, he's like, and, and check these out. These are called sports beans. And um, the brand name of these was Jelly Belly. And they were basically jelly beans repackaged in a package that um, was for sports. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they hand them out on the courses and all the the drinks that are supposed to give you energy and the way that you're getting that energy through those drinks are, of oh, course, with, with sugar and carbs. But I was buying into that because yep. um, I felt like that's that's what I was being told that I needed to fuel my body. Um, and as we went through the summer and I was using those products and training way too hard, I started to break down again. My knees start, my, my weight started going up <laughs> and my knee and ankle pain started coming back uh, with a vengeance, which we talked so, about when I would come in for my yeah. monthly checkups. 
And and that was the point I wanted to bring up. So, you know, at that point in phase four, we had you on a once a month uh, visit and you were one of those people that were very diligent with that. You came in each month and we would talk about how are things going, et cetera. And we were able to see this trend, right? Um, we were seeing that your weight was starting to creep up. Uh, you, you did have a new injury almost each month when you came in and uh, it was, it was really, it was starting to weigh on you and it was really starting to, to weigh on me quite actually, I got to tell you. Um, so, you know, what is interesting um, during this time period, during this year, I was actually going through uh, my continued transformation and the next evolution for me was that year was the year that uh, I finally gave up sugar and starches and processed foods um, for the first time really in my maintenance life. I always allowed that stuff to creep back in and I was the, just like everybody, how much can I get away with? Um, and so this year I decided I'm done. Uh, it doesn't make me feel good. It, it, every holiday season I become fat, sick and depressed by January 1st. I would do the phase one like everybody does in January because I knew it would take whatever weight I gained off. But I was I was sick and tired of of going back to being sick and tired. And so, man, come that summer and and getting into fall, I felt better than I had ever felt. And I realized that uh, I had a chronic swollen right ankle uh, for over 25 years. And it was the thing that really kept me from being active in the first place. Um, and so over that time period when I was eating what would be considered to be a, very, a low carb, healthy fat approach to maintenance, uh, that ankle healed up. And in the process of that happening, um, I did some research and I wanted to try to get back to running myself. And in fact, in my twenties, I was fascinated by the sport of triathlon. And as I was diving down the rabbit hole, reading everything I could on low carb, healthy fat, um, I, I happened back into, I kind of reconnected with, uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone. Uh, he was a endurance, uh, training, uh, he was a chiropractor first, but he trained high level endurance athletes and he trained them in this crazy thought that their bodies should burn fat instead of carbs for fuel. And he trained them in ways that were very unconventional back in the late 80s and 90s. Um, I was fascinated with him back then and had just kind of let all that stuff drop. But I picked it back up this summer and I started reading. And it made sense with everything that I had just been through in the past three years. Um, so Phil Maffetone led to Mark Sisson and Primal Endurance, which led to Volok and Finney and uh, Low Carb Performance. Uh, Tim Noakes, one of my heroes of all time. Um, and these guys now, uh, they all espouse a low carb, healthy fat approach to endurance training. So I, I started to pass these on to you. You were always very receptive, um, to books, uh, and things that I would pass on to you to read, right? Yes. Yes. And in fact, what, what was, well, we'll get back, we'll get into that a little bit later on, but so I, I had you start to read these because it was my goal to convince you um, that you should shift gears. Yeah, I, um, you know, I had run the historic half in May and, and had run with the 12.58, a 12 minute, 58 second pace, which was faster than I had ever run before. And I had started having that pain and injury creep in. So by the time I ran my next half marathon, which was the Prince William half marathon, um, I was in so much pain. That's when I was starting to try to use braces on my feet and knees to keep the pain away and tape. Um, my pace went down to uh, 13 minutes and 17 seconds. Uh, I was in a lot of pain. I was feeling very discouraged. And that's when you started sharing that uh, information that you just talked about in those books. And uh, I wanted to know, I wanted to know how can I do this better? I felt so good when I started running again and I was starting to go back down that same path that had, knocked me off before and I did not want to go there. So yes, I, I, I read all those books and more. <laughs> so, so again, at this point, let's stay in context where you were in your timeline. Um, you know, uh, I keep talking about the power of this protocol beyond weight loss and all the different things that it does for us inside, uh, the, the shift and reset of metabolism and, and everything that goes along with that. Um, and it, it, 
it was amazing to see you redevelop everything that you had before you had gone through the protocol. And, uh, but we decided, you know, gosh, there's no way that you can shift gears now. Uh, it's too close to race day. Um, so take us to, take us to the Marine Corps marathon race day. Yeah. So, you know, here I was uh, realizing a goal that I never thought I would be able to achieve, which was to run a full marathon. Um, of course, I was extremely excited and caught up in all the excitement uh, at the expo and the morning of the of the race. Um, I was ready to go. As you can see, I was taped up. <laughs> I was going to try to keep all of that pain and uh, hurt away. I had promised myself I would stay happy through the whole race. I would not show any disappointment. I was going to keep my mindset positive and I was going to make that 26.1 miles and I was going to finish it. I didn't care even what time. Um, do you want me to tell a little bit about what I did through the race? About my oh yeah. I, I think, I think we need to hear that. Okay. Uh, the, so, yeah, the I, K -K off, I, felt, I felt okay. I was ready to go. Um, but I was uh, very afraid of that sweeper. I think if, if any of you are racers out there, you know about the sweeper bus. If you don't meet a certain cutoff time, the sweeper bus will come pick you up and take you back to your car. Um, so I didn't want to have that sweeper bus come sweep me. I wanted to finish this race. So I started off fairly strong and then about a uh, mile 10 or 11, I started to have a lot of pain again and I would stop and walk a little bit and then my, my pace was slowing down. Um, and by the time I got to mile 17, my husband was there as my cheerleader. There was a point where he could come and talk to me and, you know, give me something, uh, some more water or whatever. And he was like, honey, you got to hurry. The The sweeper bus is coming. You got to pick your pace up a little bit. And I was like, I just hurt so bad. But he's like, you can do it. I know you can. You're you you prepared for this. So I did. I, I hurt. But, um, you know, I my my foot hurt when I walked and my knees hurt when I tried to jog. But I just walked and jog, walked and jogged. Um, and kept that pace, that sweeper bus behind me. And I, I finished. I did finish. I was so happy I finished. Uh, once I got to like the mo last mile or two, I was back with all the other people who were in pain <laughs> and having a hard time finishing. And they were all moaning. I could hear them like, oh, and I would try to get past them real fast, like walk faster because I was trying to keep that positive mindset. I didn't want to get negative or think about the pain I was in. Um, so I got my medal with the Marine. I got my picture. I barely remember walking because you have to walk through this little gate. You get your bananas and your food and your after race drink or whatever. Um, and my husband met me where the where the uh, audience, you know, the people that were cheering you on could meet you. Yep. And he walked me over to my little spot and uh, I took a drink of water and I think a bite of banana. And I thought I was going to fall over and throw up. I was holding my earbuds on my metal list. I'm like, take these off so I don't throw up on them. <laughs> he was so worried about me. He went and got the medics. He didn't even walk me to the medic tent. They came and got me in a little car and drove me to the medic tent. And I had to lay there for a while and they had to check me out. And um, uh, when they released me, he, my husband was like, you know, there's there's the after party. Do you want to go? You've done all that work. And I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> I just want to go home. Yeah. And I said, I'm so glad I did that. I am so proud of myself and I will never run a marathon again. <laughs> I'll never do that to myself again. <laughs> yep. And I remember you coming in and, and telling us the story and uh, that was, you were, you were very adamant about that. And yeah. I think if we, if we ask your husband, he will let us know that you were very adamant about that. He reminds me every time <laughs> trying to bring up it, any, what we're going to talk about later. <laughs> So, so lo and behold, right? Um, we had made the plan that you were going to make it through the Marine Corps Marathon and that after that was done, you were going to take time off from running so that you were going to let your body heal. Mm -hmm. And when you were ready, we were going to get you back in phase one and we were going to relose the weight uh, that you had gained in the process. You know, again, the idea pounds. of 17 the pounds. idea okay, of. 17 pounds. <laughs> Gaining weight while you're training for a marathon. Doesn't that sound like a paradox, right? I didn't even know that this was a phenomenon. And the more people that I talked to, the more runners that I talked to, oh yeah, doc, I always gain weight when I'm training for a race. Um, 
really doesn't make sense. That's a, a disconnect there. That should be a red flag. There's something wrong about that nutritional approach that you might be using. Um, so we decided that we go ahead and do that and, you know, not only get rid of the weight that you regained, but maybe even head towards that, that original goal that you had. Right. Yeah. And again, lo and behold, it was the holiday season. <laughs> <laughs> two for two. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And that, that gets us to the point too. So back to my journey, my journey, I was going so far down this rabbit hole and I was so excited about the information uh, that I was reading and how I was able to put it together. Um, and I was working towards my first 5k uh, in over 25 years, uh, the turkey trot. And so um, in the process during this time, I started to uh, do some continuing education myself. Um, I, I did a certification in what's called metabolic efficiency training, uh, with Bob C. Bahar. Uh, this was brought to my attention by a high school buddy of mine. Who's a world renowned, uh, triathlon trainer. And I had pinged him to ask him, uh, where I should go in my next step as far as, uh, continuing ed in this department. And he, he brought me to Bob. Um, what an amazing certification that I went through. And the whole idea was, uh, just reinforcing a lot of the nutritional concepts that we've talked about and trying to get someone reset somebody's metabolism to the point where we're what we're called metabolically flexible. We burn fat when we want to burn fat and when it's most appropriate. And we burn carbs when we need to burn carbs and only when we need to burn those carbs. I also uh, was doing some continuing ed training uh, with Endure IQ. Um, Dan Plews, who is the reigning uh, age group uh, record holder at Kona, did it, low-carb, healthy fat. And uh, so I started to apply these principles not only to myself, but we, were, we started to apply them to you. Um, so in the process, uh, we started talking about the concept of storage tanks, right? We talk about this in Ideal Protein. Uh, but I want to focus real quick just on the two primary storage tanks. Yes, we can use protein for fuel, but we don't want to. And uh, that that's for emergency use only. We want our body burning either fat or carbs at any one time. And when we look at these tanks, uh, the concept that came up that is, is mind-boggling is the idea that our carbohydrate storage tank is so small the average human being can store between 1,300 and 2,000 calories of carbohydrate fuel in their body, and no more than that. Your carbohydrate storage tank is primarily your muscles, right? We store, we store glycogen in our muscles in a small uh, reservoir of our liver. And after that, that's all the carbohydrate fuel that we can store. So if you've got a lot of muscle on your body, you're going to be up higher towards that 2,000 calorie end. If you don't have so much, if you're a, a smaller person, Maybe it's only 1,300 calories. So if we're going to rely on this little teeny tank to power us through a half marathon, much less a full marathon, that sounds crazy to me. How about you at this point, Cindy? Yeah, the, the, the carb and glycogen tank, how, would, how do we do? It's so small. Why would you ever consider trying to use, you know, what's it like yeah. trying to run a race on carbs? For some reason, it's the it, it is the prevailing way to do it. So you know, you do that by con continually adding sugar to your tank throughout the whole race. Um, I know, like when I was preparing for the the marathon, I bought like a special belt. I had a I bought a handheld uh, water uh, container that had a pocket in it. I had to have all of these places to store all of the sugar that I needed to refuel my glyc glycogen tank throughout the race. And that's what race, that's what racers do. <laughs> As a matter of fact, races give uh, put little stops along the way with these sugary substances as well for racers to use. It's just the way um, mm -hmm. people run these days right now for the most well, part. And if that is going to be your primary fuel, you're right. You have to keep trying to refuel that. And so the other thing that I hadn't really understood is um, porta potties all along the, the mm -hmm. routes for these longer races, especially, um, you know, the gastrointestinal distress that people go through because they're trying to process these carbohydrates quickly and get them to their working muscles. And it just makes no sense. Right. So, yeah. You know, if we revisit that and go back and look, uh, 
conversely, unfortunately, the body has an unlimited capacity for storing fat fuel. Um, and if you look at the people that are winning marathons, right? The, these skinny people who don't look like they've got any body fat on their bodies. It's fascinating to find out that even those people are carrying around 30,000 calories of fat fuel energy in those skinny little bodies. So what I like to say is the rest of us, we're just carrying more than that. Um, but imagine you're carrying around this huge fuel tank around with you. You're dragging it 13.1 or 26.2 miles, and you're not tapping into and using it at all. Instead, you're so focused on burning sugar and using your little tank. Uh, it just seems like a very inefficient way to go about this. So this was really um, the crux of, of uh, a lot of the science that I was learning, a lot of the theory behind why we want to become a fat burning machine, why we want to make the, our body's ability to burn fat uh, the most efficient possible and actually at much higher heart rates and intensities than were previously thought possible. The yeah. second part of this, okay, and this was very hard for you to wrap your head around and, and most runners too, um, is the idea of training with a heart rate, right? Yeah. So, um, never heard of it what, before talking yeah. to you. <laughs> and so this is a concept from Dr. Phil Maffetone that again, uh, I had seen in my twenties and was revisiting now in my fifties was the idea that there, he, he put together a formula after years and years and years, um, of what he called the maximum aerobic function heart rate or math heart rate for short. And uh, this formula looks like this. It uses 180 and you subtract your age. And then he's got a table of modifiers where you might add or subtract a couple of beats per minute. And that would be your math heart rate. And what that, what that heart rate stands for is the maximum heart rate your body can achieve and still uh, burn fat as its primary fuel and keep up with uh, your needs, your energy needs. Um, so it struck me, you know, again, in phase one, uh, we're so concerned about your body keeping up with the energy demands by burning fat and not, not breaking into protein, uh, that we keep most people to walking as their primary exercise. Um, one of the concepts that I learned is this concept of fat adaptation and how long it takes to really build that fat burning machinery. Uh, to get that efficient. And in general, three to six weeks uh, seems like uh, what it takes to initially get your body fat, at, fat adapted. Um, so it was our theory that uh, you would go ahead and do three to six weeks in phase one without any exercise. You were still recuperating and resting, so you didn't really even want to, right? That's right. <laughs> and then we were going to get you walking and or jogging underneath of this maximum aerobic function heart rate. Uh, which we had calculated for you, 180 minus your age got us to 125. And then we added five beats a minute because you were a trained runner in the first place. So I gave you a ceiling, a maximum aerobic function ceiling at 130 beats a minute. Yeah. What was it like? What was it like training there? That was uh, extremely frustrating. I was very, very open to everything you were coaching me to do, of course, and I was committed to trying it. Um, but it, it, it does get frustrating. It was frustrating for me. Uh, I, I live in a very hilly area, and I know when I, because I was coming weekly at that point um, for coaching sessions, and uh, I was like, I can't, I can't even run because I start going up a hill and my heart rate just starts going up so high that that I have to stop. And, and you're like, yep, you have to walk. <laughs> you're like, maybe don't do the hills, find a treadmill um, and that kind of thing. And it, it, it's hard. It's hard when all of your um, running friends, uh, their philosophy is run as hard as you can every single time you run and post what your paces are and everybody gets the big thumbs up for the fastest paces, you know, and I feel like I'm crawling along like a turtle. But all along, I was reading the books that you were giving me. I was listening to podcasts. I was finding YouTube videos by <laughs> Dr. Malcatone. I was looking at anything that could help keep my mind learning about what it is that we were trying to do. So I did stay committed um, to you, running you, slow, to learn to run fast and keep keep 
the carbs controlled. <laughs> you know, I and what was funny was I created a monster. It was it, your <laughs> a, your appetite for podcasts s- surpassed mine tremendously, and uh, it was fantastic because you were feeding me uh, people that I hadn't seen yet, um, and it really I, I loved how you had caught you'd been bitten by the bug, right? Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to learn what was happening with my body. I wanted to know. I did not want to just uh, let it happen and then try to figure out how to fix it. I wanted to know what was going on with my body so that I could build my body to be strong. And the only way I could do that was to arm myself with with knowledge from people who had years and years and years of experience or it was research based. Um, like Dr. Yep. Ben Bickman and that kind of thing, who are researchers and maybe not even runners, but but they were learning about um, what's going on with your mitochondria and what's you know with with fat burning and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. I was I was avidly reading and listening and <laughs> taking in anything I could. And and again, uh, hearing it from experts in the field and not just me, right? And yes, I always yes. I always try to support everything that I'm I'm coaching my people with. Number one, I've done it myself, and I coach from personal experience first. Mm-hmm. But number two, I try to make sure that I'm funneling all the resources uh, so that they're hearing it from the experts and not just from me. Um, so. Uh, speaking of picking up the pace, um, so next, uh, what was really pretty neat was. I had created a uh, an alliance with George Mason University's Exercise Physiology Smart Lab, and in my certification training, I uh, come to find out that there was a test that we could do, a metabolic test, that would show us how efficiently your body was burning fat or carbs as its primary fuel, especially during activity, especially during running. So in effect, what we could do is measure what your maximum aerobic function heart rate was going to be. And uh, so I got you and I got my daughter, Caroline, who's always up to be a guinea pig for me. And uh, you ladies came. That was such a fun day. You ladies came to the smart lab and uh, we we went ahead and we did this testing. And uh, I want to go through this real quick because I do feel like it's valuable for people to understand, um, especially athletes and runners. Um, we assume and we have been taught that, especially as runners, our body will burn fat as its primary fuel at low intensities. And there will come a time when the intensity gets to be higher and our heart rate gets higher that our body will shift from fat burning to primarily having to burn sugar and carbs. And that's just the way it is. Um, So that was the standard that I was brought up in in my exercise physiology degree. Uh, That's what we had learned. And so if we're looking at these graphs real quick, I just want to show people uh, the the graph that's down in the lower left-hand corner is a graph of just exactly that. Uh, what we would expect to be normal, what would we expect to be uh, typical for somebody, the red line indicates fat burning and the black line indicates carbohydrate burning. So at a low intensity, when somebody gets started doing this test, we expect them to burn more fat than carbs. And once we get uh, up to a certain uh, certain intensity level and heart rate, for this person, it was 140. This is just an example. Uh, their lines cross over. It's the crossover point. And then their body burns carbohydrates or sugar more than they burn fats in order to maintain the higher intensity exercise. So we assume that this is how everybody starts. This is what normal is, right? Uh, What we've come to learn is that bodies that are insulin resistant, bodies that uh, are unhealthy, bodies that don't handle sugar properly, have a graph that uh, looks like the one at the top on the left. You'll notice the black line, the carbohydrate or sugar burning line, is higher than the fat burning line. In fact, they start off burning sugar just at rest, and they are not really burning fat hardly at all. Their lines never cross. They start burning sugar, they finish burning sugar, and they really haven't tapped into their fat stores hardly at all. This is a struggle, and this is what so many age group athletes in in running races and triathlons who are uh, carrying more weight than they want to, who are not healthy, uh, they're insulin resistant, this is how their body is functioning. And so what we really want to do is we want to we want to reset metabolism back to healthy. Um, back to metabolic flexibility where your body can tap into that fat tank. And that graph demonstrates it. It proves it. 
So when we did Cindy's, and I'll bring you, let's, let's bring it back in here. When we did Cindy's test, she had been training now probably a good three to four months. Uh, yeah. She had been in phase one. She had uh, fat adapted for three to six weeks. She had done math training, heart rate training for weeks to a couple months. And we were just really excited to see if her training was, was coming to fruition. Um, so we went into the lab and I told the graduate students that were running the tests what our theory was and what we had hoped to see. We wanted her crossover point to be much higher um, than you might normally expect. And in fact, if you look at Cindy's graph, which is the large graph featured on the right hand side, her fat burning line, her red line started at rest. She was burning like over 90% fat at rest. And as you see, those lines get close to each other, but they don't even cross over. She had no crossover point. Her body burned fat more than it relied on carbohydrates for the entire test up until we stopped it at 162 beats a minute. You want to tell us a little bit about that experience, Cindy, real quick? Yeah, I think I was on the treadmill about 25 minutes or something like that. I can't remember. It was going, you know, I figured we'd stop much sooner than that, but I just kept going and right. I kept going. And uh, Dr. Barnes and the, the assistants were like, had their heads together looking at the machine and y'all were talking and I kept going. And then they kind of increased the pace and I kept going and I kept going and I kept going. And finally, uh, Dr. Barnes was just like, okay, we're going to stop now. I thought something was wrong <laughs> because no one ever... It just looked weird the way you were talking. And so when I got off and we got all the contraption off of me and everything, I was like, so am I metabolically healthy? And and you said something like, you're better than that. You're metabolically flexible. It was like we were we were just astounded. Like yeah. I couldn't even take in what had just happened. And the, you, you didn't show me the graphs until I think the couple of days later when I came from yeah. my consult. But you, I had to, you, uh, yeah. we were all had, like, wow. <laughs> I had to crunch the numbers and make that pretty graph out of uh, the raw data that they were going to give me. Um, but that was the thing, right? Uh, you surpassed what I wanted or expected for you. I wanted to see that, you know, maybe we could get you instead of 130 beats a minute, we could get you to 145 beats a minute. And that was your crossover point. Um, you know, never did I dream that we had already achieved uh, such an efficient fat burning machine in metabolism. And uh, quite frankly, the graduate students were mind blown. Um, they'd never seen a graph like that before. And, uh, they, I, I still don't think they believed it. Um, so yeah, just fantastic. Um, so then uh, we started to get to racing season again, right? Yeah, we did. Uh, so first half marathon after that. Yes, Shamrock. that was the Shamrock in April. And I ran that, uh, I'm just trying to get to what that pace was. I had like the best pace that I had ever had. And now I'm not um, finding it, Dr. Barnes. I don't know if you have it on there, but uh, I PR'd. I PR'd yeah. my half marathon pace at the Shamrock in April. And yep. uh, I, I didn't carb load before and I didn't carb load that morning. I drank my keto coffee and uh, we were using you can at the time. So yeah, I ran the whole race with no uh, additional fuel. Yeah. You know, it's amazing because too, uh, we wanted to touch on that real quick, that, that pre-race meal, we quickly learned um, that in fact, if you consume a high carbohydrate pre-race meal, uh, what does that do to you? It actually short circuits your metabolism. It starts you in sugar burning. It locks up that fat tank again because it created an insulin response. And so you're stuck starting that race in sugar burning and you have to continue that race in sugar burning. So we swapped that approach and, uh, you know, definitely did not start the day with carbs. And because we knew your body was already churning out those fat calories, right? Exactly. Yeah. We knew if we started with carbs, we'd turn off my fat burning machine. So we and weren't we going to do that. that. We wanted yeah. to make the machine burn like we had trained it to do. <laughs> and yeah. we did that for every half marathon I ran throughout the rest of 2019. Um, the national woman's half. I ran the Prince William half again, just to have a better race for that race. And every time I ran, I would shave off, you know, four or five minutes of my time for each half marathon. I PR'd all throughout the, the year. Yes. And I know you had a very aggressive race schedule all year mm -hmm. long. 
And it was amazing to see. Didn't matter the distance. Uh, you PR'd every single time you stepped out. You tied those running shoes up and stepped to the race line. Um, and that continued throughout that entire year. And that's a dream year for a runner. Yeah, it was awesome. It was an awesome and, year. And not only that, it's not just about the times. Uh, no injuries. Yes, I felt great the whole time. I didn't have to like soak my my legs in a bathtub full of ice. I did not use any tape or any kind of uh, things for my knees. I felt incredibly fit and awesome the whole year, no matter how many times I was running. <laughs> yeah, did not have right? to go back to that. It gave no. my tape away to other people. <laughs> and I think that was brilliant, right? And I remember you telling me that, oh yeah, I gave away all that stuff because I don't need it anymore. Uh, yeah. That that was fantastic. Um, so quite a year. You wrapped it up really great. And then uh, as part of this journey, um, you had said never again to a marathon, but I could kind of see that tide was turning uh, later on in the year. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you actually have a, another full marathon scheduled for this year? I did. I think it was probably around... November or December that I had felt so great through all my races throughout all of 2019. I, I decided to challenge myself to do the New Jersey marathon, um, in April of 2020. My husband's like, you said never again. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Barnes said, you said never again. And I'm like, yeah, but I think I'm ready now. It's different. I'm a different person. Um, so yeah, and and that was when we had decided to use Dr. Kinsella's, uh training plan uh, yeah. because it fits so well with what we had already been doing with the the math training and the low carb running. Yeah, so you know, again, continuing on with my education and, and my journey, um, talking with my my buddy Ken Murky, the triathlon trainer, uh, he introduced me to to this guy here, uh, Mark Kukazella. What an amazing individual this man awesome. is. Um, just an icon in, in the running industry, an icon in low carb, healthy fat. Uh, he's a medical physician, primary care doctor in West Virginia. Um, he, uh, the hospital that he works at, he has created one of the very first low carb, healthy fat diabetes, uh, programs and centers there. Uh, he owns his own running store, two rivers treads. Uh, he is an advocate, not just for low carb, healthy fat approach to health, right? Health first, yeah. uh, and then running, uh, but also other things like, uh, barefoot running and zero drop, drop shoes and proper foot biomechanics. So he wrote this incredible book run for your life that came out. Um, we both really love that. We got to meet him a couple of times whenever he comes to Northern Virginia and just, I feel truly blessed, uh, to count this man as one of my friends. And you took and a, I drove a trip to West Virginia. To yeah. You took a trip up to the and, store, uh, yeah. right? <laughs> and he gave me another signed autographed copy of his book yeah. with my friends. We had an awesome time. It's not that far. He's awesome. I love him. So much. Half marathon and marathon training uh, schedules in there. Uh, new training approach, you decided that you were going to adopt. Uh, this one was going to be easier on your body and on your joints. Um, you know, you were not going to adopt an aggressive race schedule this year. No. The pandemic hit and, and lo and behold, things have changed. Yeah, I had only signed up for the New Jersey Marathon in April and a half, uh, the Bird in Hand Half Marathon in September. Um, and I wasn't going to do much more. You and I both talked about, you know, maybe uh, less is more. Um, and that, you know, I didn't, I, I had actually accomplished and proved to myself what I wanted to prove to myself in 2019. I did yep. not need to prove that anymore. Uh, I knew I could do better just by training and keeping consistent with uh, low carb and, you know, having the 80, 20 math and some speed. And that's what Dr. Cooksella's book has in there. Um, so I, I, yeah, but now I'm just running for fun <laughs> because the races have been yeah. canceled or put off. So we'll see if they happen in the fall. So we're going to wrap all this up. And when you and I were talking about this, um, 
it, you do have uh, that marathon that's still, well, again, it's been rescheduled. So we're crossing our fingers that we'll get to the point where you actually will get to run that in the fall. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things that struck me, and it's so amazing and why I like to call you the master of your metabolic health, um, you blew me away when I said, so Cindy, life possible for you. What, what does that look like uh, now? What are some, what are your goals? What are your dreams for the future? Um, I loved your answer. Uh, so <laughs> tell us about what you told me. Yeah, you know, um, my lifelong goal right now, my major goal is to live to be 125 and to still be running in some uh, way all the way through while I'm alive, um, to, to not feel pain, to live long and health, a long and healthy life. And I believe I can do that. Yeah, just uh, again, I think the best thing that has come uh, from your journey is your obsession with metabolic health. And in fact, you shared with me that, uh, you know, you used to kind of dread going in for your annual exams and your blood work, et cetera. And nowadays you look forward to it because you're, you're curious as to what your blood markers look like. And, and I just thought that was so amazing. You're so on top of understanding uh, what those markers look like. And you, you feel like you actually have control over those things right now. Can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, for all these years when I wasn't feeling well and I was battling with my health and my, my weight and my fitness, um, you go in, you get your annual, the doctor takes blood, they look at it, they tell you, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, but, uh, I never asked to see my results. I wouldn't have even known what to look for to look at my blood test results. Um, and honestly, at that, at that point where I was at my heaviest, uh, 255, 256, I was, um, I was pre-diabetic. When I look back at those test results now, I was pre-diabetic. No one ever told me. <laughs> no one ever told me that, that there was problems. Um, but now when I get my blood tests, I look, I ask for the results. I even ask the doctors what, what kind of tests I'd like to see have run. Um, and um, yeah. I, I love looking at it and seeing that all my inflammation markers are lower. I know, you know, what my A1C is now, you know, I know, yep. <laughs> I know what my triglycerides and my HDL mean, and it's all getting better and better every time. And, and, you know, too, uh, amazing during this whole COVID experience, right? Uh, the pandemic. And um, one of the things that has truly come to light during this is the uh, abysmal metabolic health of our country. Um, when we look at the people that are having the hardest time dealing with COVID-19, it's because they're not metabolically healthy. In fact, uh, I just recently listened to a podcast by Dr. Mark Hyman and uh, Dr. Darius Musafarian, and they were saying that um, the incredible relationship between metabolic health and the way that people uh, were dealing with this, um, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and obesity being the top comorbidities that would uh, guarantee almost hospitalization. Um, they said if you had one of these diseases at this stage of the game before COVID, that that gave you a two to three times more uh, chance of being hospitalized if you were to get the disease, if you were to get COVID. But if you had two or more of those problems, which most people do, they usually don't just have one of those, there was a 16 times chance that you were going to be hospitalized if you contracted COVID. And all of this can be related back to insulin resistance or, or what we would call uh, metabolic health. And in fact, the statistics that I've heard both from them as well as from Dr. Ben Bickman, our, one of our favorite, favorite, favorite authors and, and researchers, is that 12% of the United States is considered metabolic health, metabolically healthy. Up to 88% of our country is not metabolically healthy. And this is the reason why the numbers in our country seem to be so high. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is the biggest battle that we face both before and after this pandemic, changing the nutrition of our country, fighting metabolic disease, uh, getting back to metabolic health. And as far as I'm concerned, the ideal protein protocol is one of the best weapons that we have uh, against in, in this battle. Yes. Does this ring true for you? Did you see it, any of this in your social media feeds and, and podcasts? Oh, oh yeah. Every, yeah. All the, 
folks I listen to um, have said that uh, about the metabolic uh, health being in the comorbidities with the insulin resistance and uh, that uh, that's what people have to be worried about with any, not just COVID, but with any, Ill, you know, the flu or whatever that has yep. just that COVID is so big right now. Yes, it's very much what is being said. And I think the big messages that you and I are trying to get across is, um, you know, just because you're fit doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy. Right. In, in fact, fitness will not get you health. No. Uh, so much more important to get healthy before you try to achieve fitness. That's a big Phil Maffetone tenant. And I think that you exemplify that. You took us through that both before, during, and after. Um, and uh, it's been such an incredible journey to go on with you, Cindy. So thank you so much for coming on today. I know we've talked our listeners' ears off. And uh, I, I'm going to have you back because I think that there's a lot more for us to, to cover in the future. Um, I do have to say, Dr. Barnes, I could never have done it without you. One of the best things about my ideal uh, protein journey is that you were my coach. Um, that you listened to me and that you were collaborative. You didn't tell me what to do every single day. You listened to my challenges. You listened to my ideas when I started reading and bringing um, my thoughts to the table. And you never said, oh, don't do that. But you were like, let's think about this. Okay, try it. And uh, you let me have that power once I was ready for it. And uh, that coaching method along with ideal protein is what has led to my ability to be successful and to feel confident now to continue to move forward and be healthy for until I'm 125. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. I, you know, again, it's, it's absolutely been my pleasure and, uh, I can't, uh, I can't wait when you and I are hanging out at a uh, hundred in our 120s. Um, <laughs> Because I think that that's probably something that now I've been inspired to as well. <laughs> All right. So let me wrap things up and then I'll, I'll give it back to you for the big finish. Okay. All right. All right. So I wanted to thank you all for hanging with us. Uh, I know that this was a very long session, a very long podcast. Um, and like I said, we've got plenty more uh, information that we need to cover. Um, so it's been so exciting the past couple of weeks. Uh, for those of you who may or may not know, we got picked up by iTunes. I just found out that we should be listed with Spotify as well. And I'm working on podcasts with iHeartRadio. Um, I am working. Uh, now we start work on the next episode. And the next episode is going to be incredible. Um, I am so excited. Like I said, we're going to be spotlighting not just clients, successful dieters and clients, but also clinic owners and coaches. My next guest for the next podcast in two weeks time is going to be a legend in the ideal protein world and ideal protein nation, Ed Reardon. Um, Ed runs uh, Results 22, multiple locations uh, around the Chicago area in Illinois. And uh, Ed has been a, a distant mentor for me. Um, I try not to bother him too much, but I, I just, I can't wait for two weeks. You got to be here. We're going to tackle some incredible topics like sugar addiction um, and, and the emotional issues behind uh, some of our eating behaviors and, and how to address those things. So tune in. Um, I got to say things like now, like, subscribe, share, uh, follow us on iTunes. And uh, I can't wait to see all of you uh, on our next episode. So I am going to bring Cindy back and then I am going to turn it over to her for the big. My name is Cindy Savage and I am living life possible and you can too.